All right, everybody, good morning. Welcome to Remnant. My name is Frank. I'm one of the pastors. I'm glad you're here. Uh, we are, uh, we're in this series, and this is the middle part of the series. It's only three weeks long. But we're looking at how to get our lives back. And what I mean by that is many of us have surrendered to Christ. We have understood what Jesus did on the cross. We've embraced him as our Savior but if push came to shove and we were asked to be really honest, we'd say, you know what? I haven't quite learned yet how to fully trust him. There are moments in my lives or perhaps areas of my life that, that I have not let go of. And, and that's keeping me from living the life that I believe God has for me. And so we're going to look at that today. Hopefully this week you spent a little bit less time worrying uh, and, and maybe spend a little more time with the... Uh, lilies and the birds and maybe you noticed some birds this week you haven't noticed before uh, I, I should ask it this way but have you spent more time praying and less time worrying that that's the key and we're going to talk about that today last week we kind of exposed this beast that we don't talk about too much and it's the beast of worry it, it's that thing that happens to us the thing that preoccupies us and last week we kind of hinted at the solution but we never really got to it so I'm glad you've come back today. I, I suspect you may have felt like I did when I got to this point. It's like, okay, Jesus, I get it. I know I'm not supposed to be spending all my time worrying, but what's the answer? What's the solution? And fortunately, we have a God who doesn't leave us hanging, who, who doesn't want to help us in our struggles. So I'm glad you're here, and that's where we're going to go today. Now, this is not anything I've come anywhere close to mastering. I'm a fellow traveler on Christ's path with you. I struggle with worry, and I'm hoping that we can learn together how to address this issue because it really does steal the joy that Jesus has planned for us. Amen. We learned last week that everybody worries, and we've been doing it for 2,000 years because, because Jesus had a lot to say about it to the people in his life. Worry is a preoccupation with the future, we said last week. It's a preoccupation with the future and trying to control it. Worry is essentially, I'm okay at the moment. I'm okay right now. But it's the future minutes and the future days that I'm just not sure about. And because I'm not sure about those future days, I'm having a real hard time living in today. Worry is trying to control tomorrow or try to get some sense of certainty for tomorrow. People go to predictors, they go to people, they go to palm readers, they'll read anything. They'll read your hair, they'll read your toes, they'll read creases in your hands, they'll look at your knee, all kinds of things to try to give you some assurance of the future. And Jesus said, I don't want you going to any of that junk. But the truth is we've Never at any point in our lives, in any category of our life, ever been able to control the future, ever. It's never happened. There's never been any certainty about the future with the exception of what God has revealed in His Word. Every day we're just reminded of how uncertain things really are. And that's when worry kicks in. Worry is... The moment trying to capture the attention to God or sometimes trying to be able to harness power so you can have certainty about tomorrow. And what Jesus said about this was absolutely incredible. For those who were not here last week, I want to kind of make three quick comments, bring everybody up to speed on what we talked about last week. Jesus made three incredible points that I want us to go back and revisit so we're all on the same page. The first thing is, you cannot add anything to your life by worrying. Not a single thing. You've never been able to harness the future. You've never been able to reach into the future. You've never been able to manipulate the future by worrying. You don't add time to your life, and you don't impact anything that will happen. Jesus reminds us it's a total waste of time. And since I have you here on earth and time is all you have, you're wasting your life worrying about stuff. Second thing, by saying don't worry, Jesus is not saying don't care. One of our problems is we read the verses where Jesus says don't worry and we interpret that as saying, well, don't care. In other words, I want a job. Jesus says don't worry. 
so I won't fill out any applications. I won't go on interviews. I won't chase leads because Jesus said not to worry about it. So you say you will not worry about it or care about it. That's not what Jesus is teaching. In fact, if you follow the life of Jesus, you never find a shred of irresponsibility. You never find a shred of Jesus saying, oh, everything's just going to work out. You never find a shred of evidence that Jesus ever is saying, who cares? Don't worry is not the same as don't care. Last week, we learned that Jesus taught the opposite. He's, he's trying to get us to be accountable. It doesn't mean get a surfboard and a latte and head down to Key West. That's not what he's saying. It means you don't have to pile up anxiety on top of anxiety over something you have no control over, which is the future. We know this to be true. Jesus once said that God expects us to do all that we can do to the very best of our ability. But once we've done all we can do, there's no need to worry about tomorrow because your heavenly Father cares for you. In fact, he says, look at how he cares for the birds. He's got you. And you're far more important than the birds. The things that you're most devoted to are the things you worry about the most. Things you don't care about, you don't worry about, right? Things you're devoted to, that's when you start worrying. If you want to know what you're most devoted to, track what you're worrying about. It's at the top of the list, whatever it is. Because your worries always lead you to your greatest devotion. So one of the best questions we can ask that we think about is this. If the things that I worry about reflect my devotion, who or what am I most devoted to? And that's where Jesus picks up the thought and takes us to a solution. In many ways, if we could just change our devotion, we might be able to change our lives. So let's pick up where we left off last week, Matthew 6, 28. And why are you anxious about clothing, Jesus says? Consider the lilies of the field, how they grow. They neither toil nor spin. Yet I tell you, even Solomon in all his glory was not arrayed like one of these. Remember that we discussed that Jesus instructed us to take a lesson from nature in order to pull back from the hyper-focus we have on ourselves. He told us to look at the birds and the lilies. And we said, Jesus, we don't have time to look at the birds and the lilies. we got to pay our mortgage. we we got to figure out our 401k. We, we've got to stay away from COVID. we gotta, we got to find some food. We, we, the supply chain, there's all kinds of things going on. We don't have time to look at birds. Jesus said, no, I'm, don't, I'm trying to help you. So just back up a little bit. And I want you to consider what I've done, have been doing, and have taught your children that I've done and grew up believing that I did. Will you stop focusing on this pile you built up and just step back and look at what I've done? Jesus says, don't lose sight of all you believed your whole life about me. Because that's part of the key of overcoming worry. So Jesus continues in verse 30. Yet I tell you, Solomon in all his glory was not arrayed, arrayed like one of these. But if God so clothes the grass of the field, which is today alive and tomorrow is thrown into the oven, will he not much more clothe you? What he's saying is a lot of this stuff on the earth is going to be gone. I say it all the time. There's nothing on this earth that survives except us. That's it. Read Revelation, the whole world, the new world, old world gone. Everything you've ever seen, everything God created is going to be gone. And a new world is going to be here. Jesus is taking us back. He's, he's, he's asking us, do you think God is good? At the core of your being, do you think God is good? Do you think God's in control? Well, yeah, yeah, I think he's in control. Do you think God started this whole thing? Well, yeah, yeah, I think he started it. Do you think God is behind it and keeps everything in order? Well, yeah, he holds it in his hand. He, he keeps every moment. It's all for him and by him. And Jesus says, or he says, okay, if you can go that far in your faith, why do you stop short of the next step? 
And this is the part where he kind of twists the knife a little bit. That's where we ended last week. Oh, you of little faith. Your worry is revealing your lack of faith. You know who I am. You know what I've done. You know I hold everything. I'm God. You surrendered to me. Where's your faith? And he says, hey, you have little faith. Now, this is huge. Even if you stop here and get nothing else, take this home in your doggy bag. There is a relationship between the size of your faith and the size of your worry. There is a relationship between the size of your faith and the size of your worry. Jesus said, the reason your worries are so big is that your faith is so small. It's interesting that Jesus takes two Greek words here and he puts them together. And it's not a word you find anywhere else in the Bible. It's almost as if he's playing with them and sort of poking fun at them. We can read this and go, oh, you have little faith. He's really chastising them. Though when he puts these two words together, it doesn't show up in any other Greek literature. It's a compound word, and it really means today, you little faith wimp, you. You little faith wimp, you. He's poking fun. He's saying, look, you've already believed the hardest part. You believe I created all this. You believe I held it together. You believe I hold it in the moment. You know that. You know it's going to work out because I also control the future. Where's your faith? You spun and you sowed and I've reaped and saved. I've done all that I know to do. You tell Jesus, I've worked hard. I filled out the application. I showed up at the interview. I followed every lead. I've done everything I know to do. I can trust God with tomorrow. Jesus says the reason you're so worried is that your faith is so small. You, you little faith wimp you. Don't be so worried. Jesus teaches there's a relationship between your faith and your worry. People with huge faith don't worry very much. In fact, they bother you because they don't worry enough. They go through the same circumstances you go to and they're totally chilled. They're not worried at all. Some of you had the privilege of interfacing with people who really don't worry. In fact, their circumstances are often worse. Their future's darker. Their future's far more unsecure than whatever you're going through. And you look at them and you go, man, I'm glad that's not me. I don't think I could do that. You think what I think when I meet those people. Wow, I... I honestly don't know if I could do that. If that happened to me, I'd be a nervous wreck. I don't know how I'd get out of bed each morning. If I was going through all that, they just seem to be fine. Not just fine, they're not even worried. What is that? Well, you've just met somebody with incredibly big faith. The bigger your faith, the smaller your worry. Jesus says, look, we need to talk about faith. You don't stop worrying to, by trying to stop worrying. It doesn't work. Everybody know that? <laughs> Jesus says, I'm going to tell you how, but first you've got to see the connection. If you don't understand the problem, you'll never embrace the solution. It's a faith problem. Your faith is small. You've not allowed your faith to go to the next level. You, you, you haven't even followed your faith to its logical conclusions. God did all that. Why do you think he can't do your future? Oh, ye of little faith wimps. And he moves on. Therefore, do not be anxious. Asking what shall we eat or what shall we drink or what shall we wear? And as we said last week, those are the worry points of his people and his culture. They worried about finding clothes. They worried about finding food. Today we have different worries. We have different concerns. Jesus said, look, don't worry about where you're going to find a job in this economy. Or maybe he's going to say, don't worry about how you're going to sell your house or how you're going to pay for your kid's college or how you're going to apply for a scholarship or how you're going to get into that school or how you're going to ensure a future for your children. How can I control the outcome of these things? You can't. How can I harness God's power to use for my advantage? You can't. Jesus said, don't spend your time stressing out about that stuff. I've got that. Did you not see the bird? 
Listen carefully because it's not important. They're very important. It's not that I'm telling you not to care. This is really important. In fact, your future is so important. Why don't you give it to me? I'm the only one that knows it. I'm the only one capable of handling it. And oh, by the way, in case you forgot, I'm the only one that can do anything about it. And the only reason you even have a future is because I determined you could have it. Your heart is beating right now because I said so. That's what God tells us. Don't worry about those things after you've done all you can do. Don't sit around worrying about the future. And then Jesus really kind of twists the knife of his teaching. He's kind of playing with them. He still hasn't given us a solution yet. Look at what he says. For the Gentiles seek after these things. Ouch. The Gentiles. Those are pagans. These are people who don't even believe there is a God. Jesus is looking and says, come on, look, you guys believe there's a God. You believe he's actively involved in your life, that he's been caring for you throughout your entire past. You can look back and see all that he's done. You believe, however, that it's okay to get bent out of shape over your future. You're acting like people who don't even know there is a God. You're practically living like an atheist. Jesus is saying, you believe all that? You're saying, yes, I believe, but that's irrelevant. I have to worry. I have to stress out. You see, God, I believe in you. I trust you, but, but I have to stress out about the future. I need to over-medicate. I got to take the edge off, God. Jesus says, you're acting like a person that doesn't even know me. Now, we live in a culture where everyone has concerns about the future. That's, that's normal. But Jesus said, look, when you share your story with people, you have the same worries. They have the same worries you have. But your response should be so different that they're amazed. In other words, they should be able to look at your circumstances and say, wow, you don't seem worried. You obviously care. You're obviously concerned. You're a responsible person, but why aren't you worried? Don't you know you're supposed to be worrying? Aren't you afraid? How do you sleep at night? Aren't you freaked out? What are you going to do? How are you going to get through this? Why don't you seem to be as out of control as all my other friends? Jesus says, this is your opportunity to shine bright for me. We believe that we exist as a church to shine light on Jesus so that our community can see him clearly. Amen. This little light of mine, I'm going to let it shine. I think as a church, as a culture, as Christians, these moments are our opportunity. We're at a place as a nation where there's more concern and uncertainties than we've ever faced before. Those of us who face the same circumstances but refuse to be bound by worry are shining a light bright in the darkness. Jesus says that if you get sucked into or distracted by worry, you might as well not even be a God for you. You're acting like an atheist. You're no different than everybody else, he says. I'm giving you an opportunity to shine for me in the midst of your circumstances. Remember what we said last week? Fear not was not only a command, it was an invitation. I'm choosing right now in this moment with your future uncertain to you, but very certain to me. I'm asking you to choose to fear not. Because you know me, and I got your future, and you're okay. The difference is not the circumstances that you find you're in. The difference is your response. We all go through bad circumstances. We all go through difficult circumstances. Jesus says, don't worry. Don't get bad out of shape. Don't freak out about the future. That's what people who don't even know a God do. You should be different and still, Jesus has not given us the answer yet. But listen to how he finishes this thought. For the Gentiles seek after all these things, and your heavenly Father knows that you need them all. Do you believe your heavenly Father knows you need these things? Do you really believe that? Wouldn't it make a huge difference if you were to live your life as if you really believed your heavenly Father knew? 
If an angel came to you tonight and told you, first of all, fear not, that's what they always say. If he just looked at you and said, hey, 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 God knows. God knows. That's all God knows. Wouldn't that be incredibly comforting? If he just knew for certain that God knows. Even if nothing changes, even if you don't know what he's going to do, even if you had no idea about tomorrow, there's somehow comfort in those words. He knows what you're going through. Because if he knows and he's not worried about it, if he knows and he's on it, then I don't really have to be as worried because he knows. So Jesus reminds, he said, okay, by the way, in case you weren't paying attention or you missed it, please hear this. Your heavenly father knows that you need them. Which means they're important. The good news is your heavenly father knows and because he knows, you don't have to worry. That's why the bigger your faith, the smaller your worry. If you could come to the conclusion that I really believe that God knows what I need. I really believe that. God knows about my loneliness. God knows about the stress. God knows about my marriage. God knows about the house. God knows about the downtrend in my industry. God knows about my cancer. If I were really confident that God knew all that, what would happen to my stress level? What would happen to my worry level? Jesus said, I know what would happen. I know exactly what would happen. Your heavenly father knows you need them all. And now Jesus finally, finally comes to the solution. He's poked fun at us. He says we don't have as much faith as a bird or a flower. You're as bad as the pagans. You have small faith. You're a bunch of little faith wimps. Now he tells us there's something that we can do rather than continuing to worry. Jesus says, I'm going to tell you what it is. And then he backs up to an idea that he presented at the beginning of this passage. And he says, you cannot serve both God and your stuff. You can't serve God and your stuff. Jesus says, the solution to worry is to redirect your devotion Your stuff is whatever you're worrying about. The solution to worry is not to try to stop worrying or not to try to convince yourself it doesn't matter because it does. The solution, Jesus says, is to redirect your devotion. Listen how he opens the statement that gives us the solution. You've probably heard this before. But seek first. That's a big but. Big contrast to all he said before. But seek first. In other words, what you've been seeking is the wrong thing. What you've been seeking is the wrong thing. What you've been extraordinarily devoted to is leading you to the valley of worry and it's stealing your today. What you've been seeking first is why you are where you are emotionally. You're devoted to the wrong thing. And it's the result of seeking first the wrong thing. So Jesus says, I want to give you the solution. The solution for worry is a transfer of devotion. You transfer your devotion by spending time processing with God rather than praying to yourself. Your devotion determines where your emotions are. Your your emotions determine what you're worried about. So here's the solution to worry. But seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. Seek first. Put it at the top of your list. Make it number one. His kingdom, his purposes, his mission. As opposed to your school or your job or your house or your kids or your singleness or your loneliness all those things are important your heavenly father knows but they can't be first because you're not here for those things you're here for the kingdom of god 
And as long as your primary devotion, as long as financial security is your primary devotion, as long as your primary devotion is getting married, as long as your primary devotion is getting the right school or the right job, as long as those are your primary devotion, you're going to worry. Because you're in a place he doesn't want you to be. And remember, I said worry is the red light on your dashboard that tells you you're not where God wants you to be. Jesus is inviting you and me into a whole new way of living. A whole new way of thinking. He's basically saying, if you feel like loving me, if you've got the notion, I second that emotion. So if you feel like giving me a lifetime of devotion, I second that emotion. This is Jesus' invitation for every one of us to surrender our lives to him. Not a segment, not part of your life, everything. Including the area that you're worried about. He says, I want you to reverse what you're devoted to. If the most important thing in your life is your mortgage or this or that, and it's not me, then you're not where I want you to be. See, you need to seek first the kingdom. I want you to seek first my righteousness. I want you to understand I'm in control. I've got this. All of your past or just future days I've already taken care of. You were worried about them too. I want you to seek my agenda for the world instead of your own. I want you to put your agenda second. I didn't say ignore it. I didn't say not deal with it. Make sure your agenda falls under mine, God tells us. You may have heard this said before, worrying is like prayer in reverse. You see, when you pray, your issues become really small and God becomes really big. And when you worry, your issues become really big and God becomes really small. It's like this balloon. When you worry, you take one issue in your life and you blow it up until your mind, until that's all you can see. Everywhere you look, all you see is that thing you've blown up in your mind. Every worry adds to the balloon. Let me show you how this works. My boss didn't seem to smile at me and say hello this morning. <laughs> she had a meeting with her boss yesterday and they were in there a long time. <sighs> Our company has struggled under the economy. <sighs> My review is coming up next week. <sighs> She's going to fire me, isn't she? <sighs> we just bought a new house. We're going to lose the house. We're going to have to live with my parents in Alaska. <laughs> We're going to have to go to Alaska. I hate cold weather. Even birds know to go south. Where did that idea of birds come from? I wonder. I haven't got time for birds. There's no work for me there. I make surfboards for a living. We won't have any money. We're not going to have any food to eat. Food pantries have food, but what if all they have is peanut butter? I hate peanut butter. I have arachnobutyrophobia, the fear of peanut butter getting stuck to the roof of my mouth. I'm not going to eat it. If I can't eat, I'm going to starve. I'm going to die skinny and frozen like a popsicle. The Alaska tundra is frozen solid. What if they can't bury me? I'm going to have to be cremated. Oh God, why are you allowing this to happen to me? Don't you care? Why are you letting these things happen? And we spend our lives walking around trying to see the world just like this. I can't pay attention to what you're saying because my worry is so big. Can't you see my worry? Because that's all I can see. That's it. It's big. It's important. She didn't smile at me and now I've got no job and I'm dead in Alaska. <laughs> you see what worry does to you? We laugh because we know it's true. 
As we focus on one thing, it just keeps getting bigger and bigger and bigger. We put more and more air in the balloon, and then all we can see is this distraction of this big worry we're carrying around. And most of what we worry about, most of what fills up this balloon is never going to happen. Jesus addresses our worry, and he said something that I've never seen any self-help book say. Jesus actually offers us a solution to the problem of worry. The antidote to worry is to pray. Prayer changes the focus of your devotion. It gives you God's perspective. All the other alternatives just make you medicate. Worry or placate your worry by focusing on yourself. But Jesus comes along and says, actually, there's a solution for your worry. And it sets him once again apart from everything and everyone else. The problem with worry is that it's an indicator we have a devotion problem. We placed our issues ahead of God's kingdom. We're going to learn next week about the action step that occurs as a consequence of our shift in devotion. But have you heard something so many times that you quit paying attention to it? it becomes familiar, you don't really think about what you're saying or hearing. Jesus summed all this up when he taught us how to pray. We probably said this a million times. We probably memorized it, but perhaps we've heard it too many times to really think about it. Don't be like them, Jesus says. Your Father knows what you need before you ask Him. Pray like this. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. That means in your life, in your circumstances, in your world, in your marriage, in your business, in your finances, in your schooling, in your parenting, in your, all that stuff. He told us to pray. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done. To accept Jesus' challenge is to seek first the kingdom in everything. Pray like this. Hey God, you know how badly I need my job. There's a lot of people here in the company and we're all very worried. We've done everything. Everything I know to do to reduce expenses, well, short of reducing my tithe. I've done all that I know to do to be a great employee, to honor you at work, to help our company through tough times. I know you created Alaska, but you know how I feel about it. I'm just saying, God, you know how much I'm afraid of peanut butter sticking to the roof of my mouth. I don't know what's going to happen, God. My temptation is to obsess over it. But what if? What if I've decided thy kingdom come and thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven? My world, my dirt as it is in heaven. God, thy will be done. Because I've made a decision that your kingdom comes before mine. If being a skinny, frozen popsicle awaiting cremation glorifies you, then let's go. I've decided to seek your kingdom first and my desire to have children second. I've decided to seek your kingdom first and my singleness second. I've decided to seek your kingdom first and my health second. In other words, I've made a transfer of devotion. I'm to the best of my ability going to surrender all of my life and say, thy kingdom come, thy will be done. No matter what happens to me in my life. At the end of every prayer, at the end of every day, when I'm tempted to worry about tomorrow, I'm going to push the pause button. We have to develop a new reflex. Worry drives me to pray. Because I've learned that when your knees get weak, you might as well get on them. God, I'm going to share my worry with you. You know what I want. I've told you that. I don't have to wonder about that. But at the end of the day, I'm going to do my very best to want your will ahead of my own. When you make a transfer of devotion, something incredible happens to your worry. I've seen it hundreds of times. I've seen people forced there through brokenness. Life is so shattered and everything is taken away. They feel they have no option except to surrender. And when they finally surrender, they find a peace they didn't know existed and they stop worrying. I know so many people that never started living until they started dying. 
Nothing about the circumstances changed. The only thing that changed was her heart. You stop worrying by becoming devoted to God's kingdom. How do we do that? Well, it starts like this. I want to worry. I'm going to pray. Let me just tell you, if you're a good worrier, you're going to be a great prayer. Because you can focus on one thing for a long time over and over and over. The problem is you're just talking to yourself. Prayer is take that same thing and talk to God because he actually can do something about it. Prayer is processing with Jesus. He's the only one who can give you perspective. Jesus, I'm going to tell you what I need. I'm going to tell you what I know. And after every one of those prayers, I'm going to pray, thy kingdom come, thy will be done. I'm going to trust you tomorrow as if I had some other option anyway. Let me just tell you something on this side. Jesus knows this to be true because he lived it. On the night before he's crucified, he goes to the Garden of Gethsemane. Do you know why he prayed three times? He wasn't secure with his future after the first two. He kept praying. He persisted in prayer. He stayed on his knees to the point of sweating blood until he could align his will with the Father's will. He came back to the disciples and said, can't you pray with me? Don't you see I'm struggling here? You see, because my will is not to go to the cross. His will is to take, I'm struggling here. I'm freaking out. It's the only time in the Bible we see Jesus wrestling in prayer. But he keeps persisting. He stays on his knees until he knows in his heart of hearts he is seeking first the kingdom of God and not what happens to him. So when you go through your worry, you're talking to somebody who's been there and done it. Every circumstance that you've allowed in my life is there to bring glory to you, God. Trials are my opportunity to shine. When people see me not worried and not freaking out, they're seeing you. I'm praying that you'd be glorified, that your kingdom would be glorified, that you would shine brighter, that people would know you better because they're watching me. That's what I want more than anything else, God. I don't care about the future. I don't care about the tumor. I don't care about what happens. I just want to make sure that your kingdom is being advanced. And you might be sitting here going, man, that scares me to death. Well, there is another option. Just keep on worrying. You may be thinking, well, what if I open my hands up to God and offer him everything, including my life, and he takes it? Newsflash, if he wanted all of it, he'd already have it. I don't care how secure you think your job is. You have no idea what tomorrow holds, none. You have no certainty about tomorrow, so why worry about it? Jesus says, look, I'm inviting you to conquer worry in every aspect of your life. Thy will be done on earth, in my life, in my future, here as it is in heaven. And then there's this incredible ending. It's a surprise, actually. But seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things will be added to you, Jesus says. What things? All the things you've been worrying about. All the things that you're concerned about. All the things that you don't have any control over, all the things that you don't know how they're going to work out, all those things will be given to you as well. They will? Yeah, really, it says so. See, because you're more important to God than a bird. You're more important to God than a flower. You've been invited to address him and call him your heavenly father. I'm no longer a slave to fear. I'm a child of God. So of course he's going to take care of you. Of course he has your future. And Jesus closes with this summary statement. Therefore, do not be anxious about tomorrow, for tomorrow will be anxious for itself. Sufficient is the day for its own trouble. In other words, when your mind begins to wrap its emotion and is concerned about tomorrow, Jesus says, stop. Remember, God's will will be done tomorrow too. I've done all that I know to do right now in this day. Rather than being anxious, I've prayed with thanksgiving, thy will be done tomorrow too. 
I fully trust you, God, with my tomorrow, and I'm seeking first your kingdom today. So what are we going to do with all this we've been learning about worry? What does this teaching from 2,000 years ago have to do with my life right now? What does Jesus want me to do based on what I've learned? How can I be more like him? Have you ever noticed that Jesus lived his entire life on earth knowing exactly that there was a day in the future at the cross? Think about that for a minute. Every moment of every day, he knew what was on his horizon. A painful, horrible day looming out in the future. Jesus told many that his face was set to Jerusalem so he could die on the cross. He knew. Jesus always, though, lived in the moment. Do you notice how he never seemed to worry about his future? He always lived in that day. Even the night before he knew he would be murdered, he celebrated Passover dinner with his disciples, and there's no indication of anxiety or worry at all on the day before. He took bread and wine. He said, this is my body. This is my blood. He knew exactly what tomorrow held for him. It's my blood. And yet he's not worried about it. And then when the moment came, that's when he presses in, in the garden, because now it's the moment. I'm not going to worry about it until the moment comes, and then I'm not going to worry about it. I'm going to pray through it. He modeled it for us. He fell on his knees. He poured out his heart. He held nothing back as he cried out to the Father in that moment. Jesus was anguished to the point of sweating blood because each day had enough trouble of its own, and this one had a lot of trouble. But through prayer, Jesus aligned and submitted his will to the Father's. And once he gained the Father's perspective, he stood up, set his face to the cross, trusted his Father, and said, Thy will, not mine. I'm seeking first the kingdom. In a moment, we're going to celebrate communion. And as we take communion today, I want you to think about that first communion on that first night with Jesus. He knew what tomorrow held. He wasn't thinking about tomorrow, even though tomorrow would be the worst day in the history of mankind. We've got a lot to learn from Jesus. As you celebrate communion this morning, I want you to ask God to help you let the air out of your balloon. Whatever you've been blowing up, whatever you've been devoted to, you've got to let it go. You've got to pray until you know in your heart of hearts that you seek first the kingdom. Many of us, me included, and me perhaps leading, have spent a lot of our time worrying instead of praying. We face our future without God's perspective because we've never persisted in prayer long enough to actually obtain it. We've talked far more to our friends to get their opinion than we have to God to get His. You need to fall on your knees and submit your will, your future, and your concerns to the Father. Far, far too long we've sought our kingdom and not his. We've wasted our lives with worry. We've been so worried about stuff. We've been so focused on our balloon that we miss today because we're worried about something that may never happen. Stolen our joy. Today's the day you can say no more, no more. Today on my weak knees, I'm going to trust Jesus. Perhaps for the first time in my life, I'm going to surrender my future to him because he has it anyway. I'm no longer going to let worry steal my life. I'm going to pray until I can with confidence say, your will, Lord, not mine. We're going to pray and then the communion tables will be open. It's time to turn our worried and weary eyes towards Jesus and trust him with our future. Let's pray. God, I thank you that Your word is so relevant to us today. It's hard, God, you know, you've been a human. You know what it's like to be on this planet. God, for so many of us, we've put ourselves in your position. We actually have acted like we think we can do something about the future. God, forgive us for taking your place. Forgive us for trusting ourselves instead of you. Forgive us when our faith is so small. And our worry is so big. God, we need your help. 
We need you to step into that place we've never been able to go on our own. We need you to step into that place and help us release our anxieties and our fears, to cast our burdens upon you because your yoke is easy and your burden is light. Help us, God, in the next few moments to begin a process of daily surrender to your kingdom. And we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you.